the flowers in this six foot window box atop the arbor have been blooming all summer long. But it's important to remember that any plant in container has a limited root run. This means you not only do you have to keep it watered regularly, but you also have to fertilize because unlike the garden, the plants can't get nutrients from a great distance. So I like to fertilize every couple of weeks with a soluble fertilizer, about a tablespoon mixed up in a gallon of water. And the nice thing about this soluble fertilizer is the plants will take it right in through the foliage as well as the roots. And by watering every couple of weeks, I can be assured of adequate growth and ample flowers all summer long. Hello, I'm Roger Swain, and welcome once again to the Victory Garden. Well, the good news is that Holly Shimizu is on the coast of Rhode Island, where she's discovered a garden with magnificent roses and a wonderful collection of surviving American elms. Back here, Chef Marion whips up a cool and crispy cucumber salad. Back here, I've got a garden thug that needs taking care of. That and more, it's all coming right up, so don't go away. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by Garden.com with more than 20,000 plants and products, tips, advice, and delivery right to your door. We've got just what you're looking for. Garden.com. Everything under the sun. At the Scotts Company, we help make gardens more beautiful. Lawns greener. Trees taller. If there's a better business to be in, please let us know. And by State Farm Insurance. Keeping our promise of protection to generation after generation. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Flowers and window boxes may need regular water and fertilizer, but this ivy is at the other end of the care spectrum. This ivy is such an aggressive ground cover that it would grow on the hood of a car. Given a chance, in another 15 minutes, that cellar window will be shut for good, unless I get out my pruning shears and whack things back. This is truly a garden thug. Now, putting ivy up against the base of the house wasn't our smartest move. But there is a place for tough customers, and that's a tough place. Let me show you. And here's just such a location. A few years ago, to level the front yard, we built this retaining wall. But being good, frugal New Englanders, we used the boulders that the yard provided us. Rocks this size are difficult to lay in a nice, tight fitting. They were just jumble packed on top of each other, leaving rather large gaps between the rocks. And to soften that, two years ago, we stuck in a few sprigs of this Baltic ivy, and already we're getting a very nice effect, preventing erosion by anchoring the soil between the boulders. Of course, in another year or two, the rocks themselves will disappear, and after that, the trees, and who knows, it'll be back at the house again. All thugs require regular pruning. Now here's one stone wall that we won't be decorating with ivy. No, this wall is far too much front stage. It's a place for what my father used to call belly flowers. Small plants that are best enjoyed when you're down on your hands and knees. We plugged various examples into crevices on this wall. It's out of flower now, but here's a little dianthus that loves the bright sunlight and deep drainage of the wall. Next to that, a little succulent, a semper vivum, sometimes known as hens and chicks for the cluster of small plants that you get around the center of a mother hen. Here's a, here's a mother hen that is yet to have its first batch of chicks. Semper vivums come in wonderful varieties and species. There are whole societies devoted to their collection. Here's another little succulent oral stackies. We stuff this right in to the face of the wall. 
Again, the fact that it's so free draining and bright sun means that succulents do very well under these conditions. But here's a little Achillea. And this, this would be completely lost in the main border. But here on top of the wall, you can appreciate its delicate little beauty. And in time, that clump will grow just as this dianthus has to completely fill the crevice. Look, look how, how lush that is. And yet the plant is well behaved. This geranium, for example, will never get so large that it obscures the wall and has to be whacked back. The challenge is not growing these, but finding the plants. You have to poke around in garden centers looking. As I say, they're modest. They're not, they don't jump up and scream at you. Just look at this Semper Vivum mill. There's, you can see why it's called a hen and chicks. There's the, there's the mother hen. There are the three little chicks. And in fact, I could break this apart and get four different plants out of that little cluster. Now let me show you how I would plant it in the wall. I've excavated a small pocket in between the rocks. We've got, we've got coarse gravel here. The first thing is to take some long grained sphagnum moss. This is just the stuff that in another 5,000 years become peat moss. This is dry sphagnum soaked in water. Bring out some of the water and stuff that into the crevices. The purpose of this is to hold soil in the pocket and prevent it from washing deeper in the wall. Just take a little bit more. It's like packing the cracks in the decks of a ship. And then the soil mix that I use is our standard potting mix with a little sand and gravel added because as I say these are plants that benefit from free drainage. Knock the plant out of its container. Position it right in there in the wall. Backfill with a little more mix. Oh gosh, it's looking good already. Just like that. And then to top it off and prevent the soil from splashing, I'm going to case the hole with a little of this small gravel. Again, just mulching the plant. Just like that. Now while I finish stuffing plants into little crooks and crannies on this wall, why don't you join Holly Shimizu? On the coast of Rhode Island, she's discovered a garden that still has a few of those great American elm trees. Today we find ourselves in coastal Rhode Island, a great place to garden. Now this site was once a dairy farm, is that right Phyllis? Yes, for about 200 years. Phyllis Kramer can trace her gardening roots back to Brooklyn, to the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Yeah, about, at about 10 years old I joined the children's gardening program there and learned how to grow things. Ah, what a good Our early <laughs> start. I was, very, <laughs> I was very lucky that they offered that. Now tell us about this house. The house is one of the oldest houses in the region. It was started uh, about 1690 and added onto and completed in 1722. Ah, such a rich history. It's wonderful to be able to live here and enjoy it. You know, I feel so deprived. Growing up, I was never able to enjoy such beautiful elm trees. They had all been wiped out by the Dutch elm disease. How old is this tree? We think it's about 200 years old. Oh my gosh, this is so graceful and <laughs> elegant. Now what do you do to keep a tree so healthy? Well, we pamper it. We um, fertilize it every year. We have it pruned regularly. We inject it um, against the fungus that the elm bark beetle carries, which causes Dutch elm disease. Do you sometimes see the damage? About two years ago, we did have a large limb that showed signs of flagging, and we had it immediately removed and analyzed. Well, you know, I think we've learned a lesson from what happened to the elm trees, which is not to plant in monoculture. Don't you think so? Absolutely, because that protects us against um, entire populations being wiped out. Well, Phyllis, I know you're well known in these parts for your extraordinary perennial garden. Can we see that? Yes, if we just go through the rhododendron ramble, we'll be able to get there. 
How do you spend your time when you're not gardening? My husband Howard and I are designers of upholstery fabrics. Is there a similarity in that work and your work as a gardener? Definitely. We use the same considerations in gardening and in textiles of color and texture and form. Very interesting. Now you've got a lot of older trees here. This beautiful Coosa dogwood, for example. Well, we think this dogwood was put in about 1950 when the rest of the Green Garden was landscaped by Lloyd Lawton, a notable landscape designer in this area. Well, you're lucky because you inherited a wonderful space to work with. And look at this tunnel. I mean, this clearly has been here for some time. Well, these are 50-year-old rhododendrons, and we keep them pruned up to expose the beautiful trunks underneath. And they are beautiful. Yeah, what a wonderful space. You know, we usually see rhododendrons as foundation plants, and they're pruned into little balls. But I like them when they're let go. And well, it's very magical to be able to walk underneath them. And look, a sea of rhododendron flowers. We find that even though we can't see the blossoms above, when they fall onto this, the earth, um, it's just beautiful. Yeah, equally beautiful and colorful. Oh, so refreshing. Now this rhododendron is gigantic. This can't be one plant. Yes, it is. And I think it's very happy here because it's behind the barn and sheltered from the wind. Do you know the variety? No, it's 50 years old and that information has been lost. Now this holly is a giant also. You should see it at Christmas when it's covered with berries. It's really beautiful. Well, I'm beginning to realize that you must have extraordinary soil here because your plants are all so healthy. Well, we're very lucky to have a soil called Newport Silt, and coupled with 200 years of dairy farming here, the soil is incredibly rich. Oh, well, that's a gardener's dream. It is. Oh, and this perennial border. You have used so many of the critical design principles here. You've got excellent symmetry and balance, and then you've got these wonderful curves along the border. And most of all, you have extraordinary use of plants, the forms, textures, and colors. And this white, airy plant just really stands out. Well, this is cranberry cordifolia. It's a form of flowering kale. And this is not used enough. Well, it's very large. You need a lot of room to you have do. that plant. You have the spikes of foxglove, which are just really beautiful on the corner, but I've never seen it look so great. Well, here we have it with um, geranium, Johnston's blue, and I love the, the two forms of the flower together, plus the two colors. Yes. Now, how did the bench come to be in the border? Well, this bench was originally on the edge of the border, but we allow our plants to migrate and do their own thing, so now it's back in the border and we can no longer sit on it. And it looks great. Well, we love it there. It's noticeable that you have used height very well in this border. We see the foxglove again, very tall back there, and just adding so much in the way of form. I love to use tall plants in the garden. Um, they give that feeling of being a child in a magical place. Ah, they do. Oh, and this combination is unreal. That luscious rose over there, and then the blue of the nepeta looks so great together, and then with this pink penstemon. Well, I love these flowers together. The nepeta, particularly nepeta siberica, yes. will bloom all summer long, and is it a wonderful does. blue. Well, I've got to see this rose, and it looks as though it might even be fragrant. It is. Oh, I never... Oh, what is it? This rose is constant spry, and it's wearing definitely its fancy dress today. And this little rose is Paul's Himalayan musk. It's coming up over the back. And they look so good together. Yeah. They really do. What about the structure? This arbor was one that I designed after information on um, arbors in George Washington's time. And a place to sit. That's right. Now it looks as though we're walking into an orchard. It is. This is an apple orchard. We have about a dozen trees here with five different varieties of apples. What do you do with all these apples? We watch them fall to the ground. <laughs> And this stone wall is just magnificent. Where did the stones come from? Well, when, they, when the farmers cleared the fields originally, a couple of hundred years ago, they 
gathered them all up and put them into walls. Any cement? No, this is a dry stone wall, and I think it's particularly significant that large stones like this, of this size and weight, were able to be lifted into this wall without any mechanical equipment. And the lichens are wonderful. Well, they're an indication of good, clean air. Oof. What do you call this garden? This garden is a cutting garden. It's all annuals. It's planted again for height and exuberant color. Yes. Um, in August, this would be covered with butterflies oh. and hummingbirds. And, and if you have time, you can cut the flowers. That's right. <laughs> but there's no now, time. Now, this looks like it's been here for a while. Well, this is a uh, black locust arbor that my husband built about 10 years ago. And the wood is very, very hard. Um, we were told by a farmer that it would actually last one year longer than a rock. Ah, well, that's something then. It'll be here for many years. The rose is really yeah. stunning. This is Sally Holmes, a beautiful single rose, and I love the color of this. Oh, this I do too. This blooms all summer long, too. And the arbor makes a great home for clematis, lots of other vines, and oh, my favorite one, that lemon yellow clematis tangutica. I love this, this plant. I love the flowers, but as much as I like the flowers, I like the seed pods that come afterwards, those fluffy, swirly Oh, heads. yes, those furry things. Yes. So you get a good, long blooming, and I think I spot another really elegant clematis over here. This is uh, Clematis Silver Moon. Because it's kind mm -hmm. of silvery lavender. It is, and it has a sort of a pale green stripe down the, the center of the petals, and it's just beautiful. It is. With large flowers. One of the trademarks I'm noticing of your garden is some really superb specimens of older trees. Well, one of the things that struck us when we came to see this property were the way the trees were pruned so beautifully into such wonderful sculptural forms. And as beautiful as this crab apple is when it's in full bloom, the form of its trunks is just as wonderful all year long. Oh, I can see that. It really is. Now here again, you've got ideal combinations of plants which look somewhat like a tapestry with the blue hosta, the purple barberry, and then this great ground cover. The echeveria, we're trying to get it to come up and cover the ground and come up onto the stone wow. here. This Which, wonderful pudding stone. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And here's another outstanding rose. Ah. Heritage? That, that rose is heritage, and it's amazing to think that that plant is only two years old. It is amazing. Now, it looks like the greenhouse has been here for a while. No, the greenhouse was put in two years ago. Oh, it was? Yes. Can we look at it? Sure. With all that you have to do, I don't see how you have time to take care of a greenhouse. Well, I find as a gardener, on a winter day, I wanted a place to go to be with the plants. Well, I can see why. And what do you grow in here? Well, I grow things like this Dracaena Song of India and ivies. Lots of ivies. This kufia hangs over um, orchids. And we have a, a water lily. This That's is a beautiful blue tropical dobbin. dwarf. Yes. Well, I think I need a greenhouse, too. Well, you should go for it. Up here next to the house, it looks as though you have a series of container gardens. Well, another one of my interests is to create compositions in containers. This is an herb garden. Yes, it is. It's convenient to the kitchen, located here, and I'm able to control the growth of these herbs while they're in these pots. And they do just as well. They do just as well as in the ground. Now, window boxes really are one of your specialties, I would say. Yes, I love designing for window boxes, and I love this variegated helichrysum in here and the scent of the heliotrope mm, in the back. I can back. smell that. Just beautiful. And over here, you're growing begonias, and I'm surprised because I've always thought of these as rather difficult. They are difficult. These are nonstop begonias, but I must have them because yes. they're so beautiful. Especially with that fuchsia. It's a wonderful combination. Now over here, I would say the theme looks a little bit different in this container garden. Well, I've tried to do a silvery combination, and I've built it around that plant, the strobilanthus, which has that wonderful silvery lavender sheen on its leaves and works so well with the double impatience it and does. the lamium. It does. What a garden. 
You know, you just appear to have everything a gardener could want. So what is next on your gardening palette? I just like a chance to sit down and enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I understand that. Thank you for sharing this with uh, us. Thank you for coming. What a wonderful garden, Holly. Those beautiful roses. Well, Chef Marion has asked me to get her some cucumbers for today's recipe. This year we're growing them on a wire trellis held up off the ground so that the fruit is straighter and cleaner. And this variety is the best tasting I've ever sampled. It's one called Aria, A-R-I-A. -A. It's a hybrid with thin, crisp skin, best harvested when the fruits are four to eight inches long. It's all female plant and the flowers are parthenocarpic, meaning cucumbers form whether or not bees get out to pollinate so you don't have to worry about pollination. But the, all you need is one taste of this variety and you will be hooked. Today I'm going to make a Scandinavian cucumber salad, one that my mother always made. It's so good, you can double it or triple it, and it keeps very nicely in the refrigerator. I've taken six cucumbers and removed the skin, and then I just slice them down lengthwise. And then for this particular recipe, I like to use just the flesh, so I remove the seeds, just using a big tablespoon. And once that's done, they simply get sliced into very thin slices like so. And six cucumbers will give you a great big colander full of them, just like this. Now cucumbers have a lot of water in them. And to get rid of that, I'm going to sprinkle them with salt. This is about a tablespoon and a half of a kosher salt. And that looks like a lot, but we'll rinse it off later. And I'm going to toss that all around and keep it over a little glass pan so that the water can leach out on the pan. Strangely enough, this process really keeps the cucumbers much crisper. And while that's steeping, it's going to take about an hour to do that, I'll make a little sauce. I've got half a cup of sour cream here, and I'm going to add three tablespoons of fresh lemon juice. And I'll just whisk this all together until it's nice and smooth. This is a very simple, simple salad when you think about it. And that's nice and smooth. And then I'm going to add just a little bit of um, oil. This is a, actually a vegetable oil that I'm putting in. And this gradually stirred in will thicken it up and give it a very nice emulsion. There. You see that's kind of thickened that sour cream and lemon juice up. And now I'm going to just season it with some salt and nice grinding of black pepper, which I love. And then I can set this aside until those cucumbers are ready. Okay, now look at this. Isn't that amazing? Look at all that liquid that's come out of those cucumbers. And now, of course, they were very salty, so I'm going to rinse them off. I want to get that salt off. This is really just to refresh them and Make sure that's all gone. And then we shake that a little bit. Now the next step, I know it looks like it's going to hurt them, but it really doesn't, is you just take it and squeeze a little bit and get that water off. And then I'm going to spread each handful that I squeeze out on a towel, and that will um, pat them dry. Okay, let's take a peek here. Yes, they look much better, nice and dry. And now I can gather them up and put them in a bowl and dress them. Now, if there's anything that goes better with cucumbers than dill, I don't know what it is. And I'm going to add about a quarter of a cup of fresh chopped dill to the cucumbers. And then, of course, our dressing that we have all ready made. And then I'm going to mix this all together. And then I like to put it in the refrigerator for about 30 minutes to crisp it up. And then it's ready to serve. Scandinavian cucumber salad served with a little Norwegian smoked salmon. Doesn't that look good? No wonder Mother liked it so much. Yummy, Marion. Just yummy. Now, Brent Heath said we had to grow this tender 
summer flowering South African bulb. It's called the pineapple lily and you can see why. Just look at those flowers and seeds forming this pineapple like head. The genus is Eucomus, Greek for beautiful headed. Eucomus bicolor, let's make it our plant of the week. Well, that's our show for today, but be sure to join us next time as Bob Spouse visits Portland, Oregon, where he was earlier this year. They don't call it the rose capital of North America for nothing. Until then, this is Roger Swain for the Victory Garden. Funding for the Victory Garden is made possible by Garden.com with more than 20,000 plants and products, tips, advice, and delivery right to your door. We've got just what you're looking for. Garden.com. Everything under the sun. At the Scotts Company, we help make gardens more beautiful. Lawns greener. Trees taller. If there's a better business to be in, please let us know. And by State Farm Insurance. Keeping our promise of protection to generation after generation. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Production of WGBH, Boston. This is PBS.